Our speaker this afternoon, Rasmus Nielsen, comes to us from Denmark, where he is an assistant professor at Raskeld University and a research fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Um, at a time when uh, many people in New Jersey and Connecticut could not name their members of Congress, uh, Professor Nielsen from Denmark did a study, <laughs> wrote a book about a congressional race in New Jersey and a congressional race in Connecticut while getting his PhD in communications at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. He's also studied the New School for Social, Social Research, the University of Copenhagen, and the University of Essex. His research to date has focused on political communication and campaign practices, digital politics, and news media organizations and their ongoing transformations. Uh, currently, Nielsen is working with a group of researchers to develop an international comparative project on the changing business of journalism. The group is examining the impact of the rise of the internet and the global recession on commercial news media across a wide range of democracies. Today, Professor Nielsen joins us to talk about his first book titled Ground Wars, Personalized Communication in Political Campaigns, which was released last month by Princeton University Press and is available for purchase and signing at the table after the program. As political observers and fans, most of us here or students here under duress, we regularly hear and read politi political campaign analysis about policy positions, paid advertising, fundraising, and messaging. In Ground Wars, new book, Professor Nielsen presents us with a different frame of analysis that can sound almost old-fashioned, focusing on personalized political communication. His book explores the subject by focusing, as I mentioned, on two congressional campaigns in the year 2008, in which Republi incumbent Republican members of Congress faced strong Democratic challengers. One was here in central New Jersey, where the Congressman, Mike Ferguson, narrowly defeated Democratic Assemblywoman Linda Stender. The other one in Connecticut, it was the challenger, Jim Himes, who won a narrow victory over the incumbent Republican Congressman, Chris Shays. Interestingly, Ferguson, who, the incumbent who won that race, left electoral politics two years later, while Shays, who lost, is now a serious contender for the U.S. Senate this year in Connecticut. The Eagleton Institute is pleased to host this program today. As you may have heard, there are those who think there is something of a partisan divide in politics in this country, and we here at Eagleton try to find common ground and ways to bridge that gulf when we can. Almost as daunting, however, are the divides on many campuses between schools and departments and disciplines, and we are therefore particularly delighted that this talk today was suggested by Dave Karf from the Journalism and Media Studies Department in Rutgers School of Communication and Information. Professor Karf describes Ground Wars, the book that we will now hear about, as a spectacular book, and I am pleased to introduce its author, Rasmus Nielsen. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, John, for the uh, kind introduction, um, and to my friend Dave, who uh, helped set this up, and to the Eagleton Institute for hosting me, and to all of you for coming. Um, as John suggested, uh, the book I've written uh, is a close-grained examination of the everyday practices uh, on the ground of campaigns as they pursue what operatives sometimes call ground wars, so field operations, uh, volunteer efforts like canvassing and phone banking. And as part of this talk, I'll give you some slices um, from that close-grained analysis of the everyday practices of politics on the ground that I hope will be of interest to whether you are here as uh, political scientists interested uh, in the theoretical and conceptual analysis of American politics, whether you are here because you, you work uh, on campaigns or want to work on campaigns, or whether you're here as citizens who are part of the, um, of the state, the, the, the country, the government, um, that these campaigns try to, uh, to influence, and that you too, of course, as voters, but also potentially as volunteers, have a say in. Um, but before I go to those sort of more microscopic slices of life from the campaign trail, I wanted to put this into perspective by presenting sort of the big picture view, if you will, the more microscopic uh, story of uh, ground wars and how they have changed in uh, recent years in American politics. I think it is necessary to have a bit of that background to understand why it is um, that, that ground wars are pursued as they are today, why they are changing, and also why, though they are strongly identified often, in particular in their volunteer incarnation with the Obama campaign in 2008, we should not um, read them through that lens primarily, but through uh, the lens of a larger um, transformation in how campaigns are waged in this country. 
So to start that, the, the big picture story, if you will, I, th I thought I would start with a number that I found uh, quite astonishing when I first uh, encountered it. It's the number of uh, voting age Americans who were contacted in person by people uh, who were working for candidates, parties, or interest groups in the run-up to the 2008 election. And that number is around 100 million. Around 100 million people in this country were contacted in person in the run-up to the 2008 election. As you can imagine, contacting such a number of people in person um, through uh, things like canvassing and phone banking is an incredibly labor-intensive effort. It involved uh, the work of millions of volunteers, tens of thousands of, uh, of paid canvassers uh, and paid phone bankers, and was organized uh, and managed and targeted by thousands of full-time campaign staffers working well more than full-time by any normal definition of that, uh, often who were engaged in something that is often not examined very closely, neither by, by political journalists or political scientists indeed, which is sort of the problematic everyday practice of politics. This is hard. It is difficult to organize a campaign, to run it, to do it successfully, and it matters how it is done, not simply for who wins and who loses, important as that is, but also for what it is like to be part of politics, whether you are there uh, as a, at the receiving end as a voter who is contacted, or whether you're there as a volunteer or a campaign staffer. So the most simple thing, if you will, the, the, the most fundamental point um, I want to, um, to leave you with today, uh, if nothing else, is that though these forms of communication, uh, a knock on a door or a call from a campaign, may seem sort of curiously old-fashioned, as John alluded to in his introduction, something that is a leftover, uh, maybe sort of a ritual remnant of how campaigns were done in the old days, but something that we simply do because it's part of how campaigns have always been done, like lawn signs or bumper stickers. The most important and, and basic thing I want to say about Ground Wars tonight is that that is not the way in which we should think about field operations. Canvassing and phone banking is as integral to campaign communications as any other form of communication. It is planned with the same care and effort as the advertising campaign. It is subject to serious investment, uh, in some cases millions of dollars. It requires hard work by staffers. It is guided by expertise uh, and advice provided by outside consultants. And it's reliant on a set of uh, new technologies that have been developed and appropriated for political use by campaigns over the last 10 to 15 years. So that though the interaction itself, if you will, the knock on the door or the call from the voter hasn't changed all that much, is still uh, pretty much the same as it's been for years, only to the extent that the, sort of the substance of the conversation may have changed as the issues change. Um, the whole apparatus that brings about that contact has really changed over the last 15 years, and the amount of um, emphasis that's put on this kind of communication by campaigns has changed in a dramatic fashion. So ground wars are important for how campaigns are waged. They're important for our democracy. Um, they're an important priority for the people involved in politics. Um, I would say that they're also, uh, again, as John alluded to in his introduction, largely absent from how we talk about uh, politics, how it is covered by political journalists, how it is analyzed uh, by political scientists. Uh, it is not completely absent, but it's not one of the central pieces. We hear much more about the debates. We hear much more about the advertisements. Sometimes we even hear a little bit about the issues. Um, then we hear about the hard work, the thousands of people, sometimes millions of people, who are working on the ground to make it possible to contact voters in this fashion, to have conversations about politics. I'll um, offer just sort of three components of what I'd like to think of or would say is sort of a dominant narrative about how campaigns communicate uh, in American democracy. One notion is the idea that uh, campaigns have become professionalized. Politics is the domain for political operatives and consultants. And um, in the title of a, a widely read book on the topic, it is no place for amateurs. A second tenet of this dominant narrative is the idea that politics has become mediatized. It is reliant primarily on television advertisement, uh, spinning of the news coverage, increasingly digital communications to reach voters. Um, the, what some operatives call the air war, uh, in, in contrast to the ground war field operations and um, the canvassing and phone banking. A third tenet is the idea that politics is, uh, is by invitation only. It is a, a battle in which parties without partisans slug it out in front of an electorate that is reduced to the role of spectators, whose only role it is to cast their vote and maybe donate a few dollars uh, to a candidate that they, that they happen to, to support, but who have no active part in the process beyond that. In this narrative, uh, ordinary Americans are targets. They are targets for the air war, and that's their role. Now, 
I'm not going to argue that this dominant narrative is wrong. Actually, I think it, get, it gets a number of important things right about how uh, campaigns are waged in this country, how campaigns communicate with the electorate, and, and what that means for politics. It is certainly the case that we've seen the rise of consultants, for instance, uh, who are becoming more and more important parts of the way in which campaigns are conceived and executed uh, across the country. It's certainly also the case that many campaigns in competitive districts in particular have become more and more expensive and more and more reliant on paid media. And of course this will only, is likely to only increase after the uh, Citizen United decision by the Supreme Court. It is also the case um, that many of the local party organizations and also civic associations that historically provided a channel through which ordinary Americans became actively involved in the political process beyond casting their vote, beyond donating a few dollars, have withered away in many places, broken down their shadows uh, of their former selves, um, kept alive in some cases by enthusiasts, local enthusiasts who are doing hard work to organize these entities, but in other places they're pretty nominal entities by now. But there's something missing in my view from the dominant narrative. It's not that it's wrong, um, that policies have become professionalized, that it's become mediatized, and that it is uh, in some cases by invitation only, and that the organizations that used to involve people in it actively have withered away. But there are some things that have changed, and those things I think we need to pay attention to to understand how campaigns are waged and how our democracy functions. One instance of that change is a change in the thinking of the people who um, advise campaigns, who uh, design them, and who uh, make decisions about how their resources are allocated. It's a, thinking, a changing thinking that has to do with how um, campaigns try to communicate with the electorate about politics. I'll give you just one uh, illustration of this change in thinking. Uh, it comes from David Plouffe's campaign uh, biography. David Plouffe, of course, was the campaign manager for uh, Barack Obama in 2008. And this quote uh, I'll give you is one in which he describes the strategic communication effort of the campaign. And what I want you to pay attention to is the way in which he talks about the field operation, the work of the millions of people who volunteered for Barack Obama as a form of communication, as a platform, as a medium, a medium for communication. This is a new way of thinking about um, volunteers. It's not um, novel. We have thought about people in this way before, and campaigns used to be largely communicated through the membership and the activism of, of, of partisan uh, volunteers. Parties were their own media, in a way, in the 19th century. Um, but it's a resurgent, if you will, way of thinking about campaigns that, that puts a new emphasis on volunteer uh, efforts in particular. This is not simply a change in the thinking of operatives. It has had real implications for how resources are allocated uh, in campaigns. To give just sort of one um, illustration of this, after the 2004 election, Matthew Dowd, who was one of the senior advisors for the Bush-Cheney re-election effort, explained uh, that, the Bush, that the re-election campaign in 2004 had spent five times as much money on their field operations as they had in 2000. Five times as much money. Millions, actually tens of millions of dollars have been spent in getting out the vote for Bush and Cheney on mobilizing volunteers through networks of conservative activist groups, through remnants of the Republican Party on the, at the local level, through uh, churches and other allied interest groups uh, and member-based groups, uh, in an effort to win the election. And what together this change in thinking and the change in allocation of resources together reflects is a change in emphasis on getting people involved actively beyond casting the vote, beyond uh, donating a few dollars in the electoral process in a way um, that wasn't as widespread in the 90s, uh, and in a way we were told we should expect to disappear. Now, the 2008 Obama campaign is sort of the poster child for this development. I mean, if, when we talk about volunteer mobilization, when we talk about canvassing and whatnot and the use of new technologies, many of you will probably primarily be thinking of the Obama campaign. Now, I think it is very important while recognizing, of course, the importance of that exceptional campaign to keep in mind that this resurgence, the resurgence of ground wars as integral parts of how campaigns communicate with the electorate, predates the Obama campaign. It predates Barack Obama's tenure in the Senate. Um, it, it is a, a resurgence that starts, in my view, when Barack Obama was a little-known state senator in Illinois. And actually, interestingly, it starts outside of electoral politics. It starts in the labor movement, where in the mid-90s, Steve Rosenthal becomes the political director of the AFL-CIO, where he pioneers a political strategy, a, new, a shift in emphasis in the way in which the AFL-CIO, the Labor Federation, and its constituent member unions intervene or try to intervene in the electoral process. Rosenthal spearheads uh, an attempt to develop at the AFL-CIO a member-based uh, political communication program, what he calls the labor-to-labor, labor-to-neighbor, neighbor-to-neighbor uh, effort. 
where the idea is to recruit politically engaged union members and to encourage them to communicate in a, in a structured fashion with other union members, with their colleagues uh, on the work, in the workplace, with family, with friends, with people in the community, to talk about the electoral priorities of the AFL-CIO, the reasons for endorsing certain candidates and not others, and in this way both try to increase turnout amongst union members, but also to try to persuade union members and their, uh, and their family and friends to vote for union-endorsed candidates. And this program is seen as a massive success. This is indisputable. Within the AFL-CIO, this has continued to be a priority, and the, and the, and the Federation and its member unions, <clears throat> and also the Change to Win unions, have increasingly um, uh, invested in mobilizing members politically in the run-up to elections in ways that are on a much larger scale than what was seen in the 90s. Much less television and direct mail, still used, still integral to the efforts of the unions, but more membership uh, activism. It was also seen as a big success by people who had little sympathy for the political goals uh, of the AFL-CIO, people like Karl Rove, who uh, after the 2000 election expressed his sentiments about how the ground wars had been waged during the 2000 election as a feeling of labor envy. He envied the Democratic Party and the Gore-Lieberman uh, campaign, the assistance that had been uh, given to them on the ground by labor unions and their members in getting out the vote. And, uh, and those of you who followed uh, this closely will remember that though Bush was marginally ahead in the polls in the run-up to 2000, actually he lost the popular vote by more than half a million, and it was a clear priority from the outset for Rove that the re-election effort had, had to turn out differently. And Rove built, as said, by dedicating much more money, uh, much larger resources to doing this, built what he saw as the largest get-out-the-vote effort, the largest field operation, the largest volunteer mobilization in recent history of the Republican Party around the Bush-Cheney 2004 um, re-election campaign. Mobilizing in the process, according to the campaign itself, 1.4 million volunteers to try to spread the word on behalf of President Bush. By comparison, the, uh, the Kerry Edwards campaign in 2004 reported that they had mobilized 250,000 volunteers. 1.4 million, 250,000. Part of the reason for this, and this I think is a part of the history of the resurgence of ground wars that really brings to light how important it is to examine how they are pursued, the ways in which they are conceived of, executed, the work that goes into them when staffers, consultants, volunteers get together and together try to help a candidate get elected. Because in 2004, Steve Rosenthal had moved on and was heading something called America Coming Together, something we today would probably call a super PAC, an outside entity, a temporary organization set up to organize ground war efforts on behalf of Kerry Edwards. Now, legally, of course, it wasn't supposed to be on behalf of Kerry Edwards because outside groups like this weren't supposed to be coordinating with campaigns. But I can safely say that now since ACT was fined almost three quarters of a million dollars by the FEC for indeed coordinating with the Kerry Edwards campaign. America Coming Together spent $80 million on building a field operation in the battleground states to help Gore and Edwards uh, in their run for the, uh, for the presidency and the vice presidency. They hired 4,000 staffers, 45,000 paid canvases, and recruited here the Wikipedia entry, um, which is all that is left of this once great organization that was back then seen as the beginning of a shadow party and it now ex does not exist. Um, mobilized um, 70,000 uh, sorry, uh, 70,000 volunteers um, to get out the vote for Kerry and other Democrats in 2004. So you get a sense here of the differences in terms of how these things are organized. Um, Bush Cheney, the machinery built by Rove and his associates that is centered around existing community groups, activist groups, the party, a candidate that inspired great passion among some conservatives that mobilized 1.4 million people, whereas the Kerry Edwards campaign with some, shall we say, absence of enthusiasm amongst parts of the liberal democratic base for Kerry, but also um, the important difference that a large part of the field operations were organized through this unknown entity, this, this sort of astroturfy organization that was set up for the purpose of this one election and managed to mobilize Combining Act and the Kerry Edwards campaign little more than 300,000 volunteers that year. The arch of the history that I've been sketching out for you the revival and the resurgence of ground wars first in the labor movement and then increasingly in electoral politics through uh, too, is one that goes from a situation in the 90s where allegedly the Clinton campaigns would be sending away volunteers who came to campaign offices because the staffers who, who ran those offices didn't know what to do with these people, what to do with these people. It wasn't clear to them that they were useful. So if you weren't in a battleground state in particular, you would be sent home. I mean, thanked for your attention and your interest, but, you know, no thanks. 
to a situation today where campaigns are positively clamoring for volunteers if they think there is any hope that they can get them, at least in competitive districts, which of course most districts aren't, because they need these people. They need these people to wage ground wars. They need help with the canvassing. They need help with the phone banging. They need help because it's incredibly labor intensive to try to reach the number of people that campaigns have aimed to reach in a personalized fashion in recent years. And the campaign staffers can't do this on their own. They need help. So a question that for me was pressing as I was retracing this history, as I did the re background research for my book, is the question in a way of why. I mean, why is it that campaigns who today, in many cases, raise unprecedented amounts of money and have access to ever more sophisticated communication technologies, why is it that they knock on doors? I mean, it seems so quaint and old-fashioned that someone would come and talk to you in person about politics. It seems like a remnant from an earlier age. Maybe there are grassroots romantics. Um, my uh, view is that they aren't. Campaigns are run by people who want to win. Uh, campaign staffers and operatives are very often partisan and ideologues, and they are sincerely committed to at least some of the principles of their party and the candidate they, that they work for. But they're in it to win it, and campaigns are designed to win elections. And campaigns today prioritize the field operations, ground war efforts, because they think it helps, because they think that this is an integral part of winning a competitive election. What they have rediscovered is what I call personalized political communication. So there's the power of practices of political communication that rely on people as media. This is the view articulated, if you will, of David Plouffe in that quote I gave you earlier on, that people are part of the platforms, one of the platforms available to campaigns that are trying to communicate strategically to people, to target groups in the electorate. <coughs> so canvassing and phone banging may seem old fashioned, but actually they are integral to the way in which sophisticated, well-funded, competitive campaigns today try to communicate with the electorate. In a way, this wasn't what we were led to believe uh, that we should expect. I mean, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we were told that this would wane away, that field operations were a thing of the past, television <coughs> and the internet, that was the future. These things are important, but field operations have not waned away. And this we know for a fact, not simply by looking at expenditures, where campaigns have spent more and more money on hiring field staffers and organizing this and targeting this, but also in terms of the number of people contacted. And this is where the 100 million come back in the story, if you will. This graph shows you the percentage of voting age Americans of, uh, who have been contacted in person by people uh, representing the two major parties in the run-up to general elections, going back to 1956, looking only at the presidential election year. So as you can see from the graph, I apologize for those of you who can't quite see it, uh, the post-war uh, average from the mid-50s till the mid-90s is about 25%, about the quarter of the electorate has been contacted in person by people representing parties or campaigns. And then something extraordinary happens. At the very point in time when we were told that this would be waning away, it starts to increase. In 2000, 35%, more than one in three voting age Americans contacted in person. In 2004, 43%, 43% of the voting age population contacted in person by someone from a party campaign. And this doesn't even include the interest groups, the labor unions, for instance. In 2008, 42%. This research is partially fueled by the development of new technologies. Those of you who work in campaigns will know about the targeting technologies that are available today, the voting files that have been amassed over the last 10 years by the two national parties that allow for much more precise targeting of people for personal contacts, canvassing and phone banking. You can speak to individual people rather than whole precincts, which of course makes this form of communication much more attractive. But the mere availability of these tools doesn't explain why they are used, why uh, campaigns have start, started to do this again on this scale. I come from Europe, uh, as my um, um, occasional um, mangling of uh, your beautiful language probably suggests, um, where this isn't done. Though the campaigns are competitive, though the campaigns have money, though the technology is available, this is not done in this fashion, or in this, indeed in this scale, to this scale. So why is it that this has been re rediscovered? Why is it that ground wars are resurgent at this particular juncture of American uh, history? In my view, we have to look at both some political factors and some factors that have to do with the communication environment that campaigns operate in. Take the political environment first. The political environment that most competitive uh, campaigns in the U.S. face is one that's characterized on the one hand by low turnout and on the other hand by partisan polarization. Now the low turnout, that one is um, 
is indisputable, if you will, uh, in midterm elections, less than half the electorate votes in, in presidential election years between 50 and 60 percent in recent presidential elections. Um, so there is a, 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 a lot to be gained from actually managing to turn out your, your supporters. The partisan polarization part is a little more disputed than political science circles where it is, there is no clear agreement on whether the electorate has actually become more polarized or whether it is mainly our elected officials who have become more partisan in recent years. What is uh, clear, however, is that most of the operatives who advise candidates and who design candid uh, campaigns and, and prioritize resources and, and develop communication strategies think that the electorate has become more polarized. So return to Karl Rove. In 2004, Karl Rove's view was, and this is on the record, that if you subtract from the electorate all the people who are so disenchanted with the political process in this country, who are so alienated from the way in which government is conduced and how elected officials, or how they think elected uh, officials uh, uh, lead their lives uh, and, and, and practice their, um, their call, if you subtract from the electorate all the people who, irrespectively of whether they consider themselves Democrats or Republicans, have such fixed views on the issues that they will always only vote for one party if they vote. If you subtract all those people, in Roe's view in 2004, what you had left, the genuine swing voters, 7% of the electorate, 7%. If you're in that situation, you have low turnout, you have a very polarized uh, electorate in which very few people are genuine swing voters, there's a great tactical incentive to focus on turning out your base. And indeed, this was Roe's strategy in 2004, the base strategy, riling up the conservative base, trying to turn out the vote, and try to win, not by moving Bush towards the center and appealing to the, to the elusive swing voter, but by focusing on divisive issues, hot button issues, and then building a massive field operation ground war apparatus to try to get out the vote, to beat the Democrats in turnout, essentially. Beat them at their own game, in his view. But there's another side to this that is not simply about the political environment. It's about the communications environment. It is about a set of developments um, that have undermined the effectiveness of the traditional, the inherited t campaign uh, <coughs> communications, the kinds of campaign communications that dominated, in, particularly in the 80s and the 90s, the air war, if you will, the television advertisement and the spinning of the news coverage. There are problems like oversaturation, sort of a factoid that's bandied around in, management, in marketing circles today is the idea that the average American is subject to about 2,000 persuasion attempts every day by corporate marketers, PR people, and others who are trying to influence their consumption patterns, their political behavior, make them do something or not do something, make them buy something or not buy something. 2,000 every day. Think about how difficult it is to cut through the clutter, even if you're running a well-funded campaign, if you have to compete against such a level of background noise. There are problems like audience fragmentation. We spread our attention across more and more media platforms. Newspaper circulation is declining. The most television channels have eroding audiences. We're spread across cable and many, many channels. In the 70s and 80s, you could put your advertisements if you were running a national campaign on the three national networks, and you would reach 70 or 80 percent of the adult population. Today, you literally have to put your advertisements on more than 100 channels to reach that kind of audience. And there are problems like the demonstrably limited effects of most mass media appeals. I mean, we know this from much research in communication that it is hard to influence people's political behavior by running advertisements. It is hard, in particular, when they are subject to a barrage of advertisements at the same time, pulling them in different directions. So against this background of oversaturation, of audience fragmentation, and limited effects, personalized political communication, which affords distinct contacts, door-to-door -door salesmanship, is prohibited or at least tightly regulated in most states, so missionaries may come to your door to try to convert you, um, but salesmen won't, and if someone is knocking on your door in the run-up to the election, it's probably going to be someone from one of the campaigns. So these are distinct ca contacts. It allows for individual targets instead of uh, getting uh, everyone who watches a particular channel or everyone within a certain media market, you decide who you want to talk to. Maybe we know that, uh, that John is one of these few genuinely persuadable swing voters. Then we want to talk to him. He's part of our persuasion universe. Um, maybe we know that uh, Dave uh, is uh, what the campaigns would call a lazy Democrat. He's partisan in his views, but he isn't consistently turning out. We want to talk to him because we want to turn him out to vote. And importantly, canvassing and field operations allows, uh, provides measurable effect. This is important. It is not a question of whether canvassing and, field, uh, and, and uh, phone banking makes a difference. It makes a difference. We know, we know this on the basis of a growing body of social science literature, but also on the basis of research done by the political organizations themselves. 
the AFL-CIO, the campaign committees, the national parties, run scientific experiments, the way we test medicine with, with a control group and a treatment group. We test whether uh, turnout can be increased by contacting people in certain ways, whether persuasion can be accomplished by contacting people with a certain message. And it proves again and again that a knock on the door or a call from a volunteer is one of the most cost-effective ways of turning people out to vote and can also persuade people to vote differently. So personalized political communication has been rediscovered uh, in recent years. It um, happens on a large scale, a much larger scale than we've seen in most of the post-war period. It's subject to ever larger investment by campaigns. It is um, a central emphasis of how campaign organizations try to communicate with the electorate today. We know from research that it works. The question that I deal with in the book um, is the more practical day-to-day -day question of how does it actually work? What is it like to be part of campaign efforts that become capable of contacting something like 40% of the voting age population at the national level through the, the totality of all the campaigns that are running in a given uh, election year, but also at the district level. Uh, you are, you're looking at contacting combined target universes of sometimes in the region of about 150 to maybe 200,000 voters in a single congressional district. This can't be done by 15 staffers working full time on their own. I mean, they need help. How do you become capable of doing this on this scale? The how matters. It matters for whether uh, it is done successfully. It matters for who wins. It also matters for, uh, for citizens who are at the receiving end of all these contacts. It matters for those people who volunteer, for what kind of work they'll be involved in, what kind of opportunities they'll have to make a difference, if that's what they want. And the story that I tell in the book is the story um, of the different <coughs> practical dimensions of this, the, the dimensions, the, inter the, the dynamics of the contacts at the door, what are those conversations like, the challenges of organizing this, the work that the staffers spend most of their time uh, trying to pull together the resources they need to do this, and the challenges of charting this. How do you do this in an efficient way? How do you reach the right people with your message instead of knocking on doors, talking to people who have already made up their minds and who might or have made up their minds either to vote or not or to vote for a certain person? How do you find the right people? I'll give you just a few, um, if you will, illustrations of why it is important to, to pay close attention to the, to the practical details of this, and I'll be happy to to follow any uh, dimension of it that you're, that you're particularly interested in. Um, so you send people out to contact people. You go knocking door to door. And the idea, of course, is, um, at least in principle, that you try to control this message the same way you do with advertising. You have a script. Um, Hi, my name is Rasmus. I'm a volunteer with Victory 08. I'm just calling you to talk to you about Linda Stender and the Democratic ticket. Linda Stender thinks the Bush administration has led the country in the wrong direction. On and on it goes. Um, it turns out um, that it is harder to control the message with live interactions and conversations with voters than it is when you're writing a script or if you're scripting a television advertising. So let me give you, give you just one example. It's from the 7th District. A woman I call Paula in the book, I use pseudonyms throughout, is a volunteer for Linda Stenders, whom some of you will know, was running as a moderate in 2008. Uh, in fact, such a moderate that the party name was rarely invoked uh, in the literature or in the advertisements and that the, uh, and Barack Obama was, was certainly not a central part of the message that was developed. But of course, this wasn't necessarily how the volunteers saw it. Many of the volunteers saw Linda Stender as what they called the old Linda, the Linda that they had volunteered for in 2006, or the Linda that they knew from the state legislature, uh, or that they knew personally. And of course, they had their own beliefs, too. So this is Paula getting into a conversation with a gentleman who is on the list of persuadables, a moderate of some sort, uh, who in this case uh, seems to be leaning towards voting for Stender's uh, rival, uh, State Senator Leonard Lance. Now, I can assure you there is nothing on Paula's script that tells her to call President Bush a criminal, um, that, in, that suggests that he has undermined the Constitution, or indeed that he has handed over billions in tax cuts to the wealthiest. But this is Paula's views, and she's sharing them with her, this voter. This is just an illustration, if you will, of how hard it is to control the message when you have a live interaction between a fired up volunteer and the interactive dynamics of having a conversation with a live being on the other scent. This is harder to control. And she is, from the point of view um, of the sort of strategic priorities of the campaign, a little bit off message, we might say. <laughs> just, slightly. just slightly. So there are practical challenges that have to do with how does this actually play out when you talk to voters. There are other practical challenges that has to do with how do you do this on a large scale? I mean, each of these contexts are as distinct as a fingerprint. We all have fingerprints. There are billions of fingerprints in the world, but each of them have their own characteristics. And it's sometimes worth paying attention to those. But how do you become capable of doing this on such a large scale? I mean, how do you contact 100 million people in person? A rule of thumb amongst many sort of field staffers is the idea that you can sort of count on a canvasser or a phone banker to make about three contacts every hour. 
three contacts. 100 million contacts, three contacts per hour. You can imagine, I mean, this is a seriously labor intensive. On paper, it's simple. You have a campaign organization. Uh, there are people who have responsibilities. There is a field director who reports to a campaign manager. There will be field organizers who have paid cameras working for them, and they go out and knock on doors. Then there is a volunteer operation. Now, in practice, even with the help of the paid cameras, um, this formal organization is not going to be uh, capable of contacting the number of people that they want to reach. They need help. They need volunteer help. They need help from allied interest groups. In the case of democratic campaigns, most importantly, of course, labor unions, um, to do this. And this in itself, if you will, is a, is a serious challenge. And one we should appreciate the hard work that goes into doing this, and also, of course, the opportunities for conflict, uh, for human mistakes, for people who are stressed out and haven't had enough sleep. Um, trying to, to convince people to take part in this. I'll just give you just one episode from briefly before election day um, where a couple of, st of staffers are facing, if you will, this, this challenge of ensuring that they get enough as they are sometimes charmingly referred to as buddies uh, on the ground um, to reach their target goals for the DOTV effort, the get out the vote effort over this, the, the couple of days leading up to the election. This is not something that happens by itself. People don't come walking in uh, that is not enough, at least. Uh, you have to, there is hard work involved in mobilizing volunteers and keeping them involved, making sure that they knock on their doors, that they come back with the information gathered, and so on and so forth. And we need to appreciate that work because it is part of the reali realities of how electoral democracy functions in this country. There are practical challenges involved in targeting. Again, um, sorry, I'll skip this one. Again, it seems simple. On the surface, you get a map. These are individual dots that denote particular voters that you're supposed to talk to. You will know the age, the name, the gender, uh, the address, the phone number of this person on the basis of the voter files that the parties maintain. Now, the voter is sometimes surprised to find that you know all this stuff about them, but you're sent out to talk to them. And of course, this is much more efficient than if you simply gave people a map of the precinct and said, knock on every door, because here you can talk to the ones who don't vote regularly, to the ones you might persuade. So targeting is about efficiency, and that is important, and it has increased the uh, emphasis on ground wars that they are more effective now than they ever were. But targeting is about much more than efficiency, and people who are intimately involved in this, both as staffers but also activists, of course, recognize this. And just to illustrate this, here is a, an episode in which a staffer from uh, the Linda Stender campaign, in fact, uh, is out uh, at a local Democracy for America meeting, this liberal progressive democratic group formed uh, from the remnants of the Howard Dean campaign in 2004 that are still active in parts of the country, to recruit volunteers uh, to help with the field efforts. And the staffer in question explains quite clearly what targeting is also about, namely control. In targeting, you get what you're giving. This is the walk list. This is the call list. These are the people you should talk to. And here there is a savvy volunteer in the room, an activist who clearly knows what is at stake here beyond effectiveness. So you give us the scripts and the lists and we do the work. That's neat. Now remember, Stender this year, not in 2006, but in 2008, was running as more of a moderate, as a centrist Democrat, not all that much as a Democrat, actually, just running as Linda Stenter in, in, in many ways. And, and Democracy for America is a liberal progressive group. So you can imagine the tensions here between the people that uh, the campaign is trying to enroll and then uh, the control they try to exercise, in part through the use of technologies that allow them contr to control who um, the campaign uh, contacts. So I've given you a few illustrations of some of the practical challenges that are involved in, in waging ground wars. Uh, uh, the challenges of, of the, the context themselves in which volunteers and paid cameras will have interactions with voters who aren't necessarily that keen on being interrupted in the middle of the dinner or, or called uh, while they were putting their children to sleep. Uh, the practical challenges involved in organizing this and actually getting, mobilizing enough resources to do it and also to get these people to work together who have different interests, who have different ideals, who may not agree with the positions of the candidate fully but still support them, who may uh, want to influence all sorts of things or have their own views on how things should be done and practical challenges involved in targeting and choosing who to talk to. Um, these challenges will be handled differently by different campaigns. And of course, many, many campaigns in this country don't need to worry about all this at all because they're not running in competitive districts. More than 300 house races this, this year are, are not considered competitive in any meaningful sense. So those candidates won't really have to worry about building a field operation or mobilizing volunteers or doing any of that. There are many states in which you won't see this done on a large scale unless there are competitive districts at the, for, for congressional races or perhaps state or local races. But in competitive races, campaigns will worry about this and they will face these challenges of 
finding ways to do this. They have different incentives depending on their target groups. They have different resources in terms of the money raised, in terms of the volunteer, volunteer enthusiasm that they inspire, in terms of the allied interest groups that might help them or not help them, in terms of the volunteers, the activist groups who try to pull them in one direction or another. You can think of the Tea Party, for instance, as an example of this. So that's why I, uh, the title of the book is Ground Wars, not Ground War. There's not one single set way in which this is done. It is a practical challenge that staffers volunteers, people from allied interest groups, together have to solve a new, every time there is an election, there is a new challenge. And we should appreciate that this is difficult and that this can be done in different ways. It is one thing to build a field operation if you find yourself in the situation of this man in 2008 with the kind of volunteer enthusiasm that Barack Obama inspired in 2008, 80,000 people watching him give his uh, acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention. It is a different thing if you're this man four years later or indeed, if you are this man, Mitt Romney, speaking at a stadium in Detroit that can technically house 65,000 people, in this case it housed about 1,500, uh, and apparently including a press photographer who wasn't content to let the campaign control the visuals. So we get a sense, if you will, of um, the difference, shall we say, in the enthusiasm um, that, that, has, that is meeting his candidacy from, um, from the one that met Barack Obama's in 2008. What they will have in common, whether uh, we are talking about this man that year or four years later or this man, is that given that they are facing a competitive race, they will be interested in these people because they need help. They need volunteer help. And in the absence of volunteer help, they will need to hire people, $10 an hour, pay canvases, people who aren't necessarily that interested in politics, who don't necessarily know that much about politics, and who we know are not as effective in terms of turning out voters, in terms of persuading voters to vote differently. They want volunteers. They may not get them because politics in many ways is part of the extraction business where you have to positively extract from the electorate every vote that you want. You possibly have to extract from a different citizenry every volunteer that you try to recruit. But they want them. They want help. And they need help because they are interested in waging effective ground wars, because they are interested in field operations, because they're interested in large-scale canvassing and phone banking programs. I want to finish by just offering you um, three thoughts on what that means for how we think about American democracy and about how campaigns communicate. Um, what does it mean that campaigns today are more interested than they have been, have been in recent memory in getting people actively involved in the political process as volunteers or in the absence of volunteers as paid cameras um, because they, uh, they want to contact people in person? <coughs> I want to um, highlight three things. I think first, if we return to the dominant narrative, this idea that politics has become professionalized, the idea that politics has become largely mediatized, that politics is by invitation only, the province of professionals primarily, and uh, a few party regulars, I think that the uh, close attention to ground wars, their resurgence, and how they are actually conducted on the ground, force us to reconsider all these three tenets. Again, the dominant narrative is not wrong, but there are things that we need to pay more attention to, things we haven't quite nailed, in my view, and that paying close attention to how campaigns are actually waged help us understand better. So take first the first note, the notion that political organizations has become professionalized. Now, again, it's true. Campaigns rely on specialized expertise. There are things they would never let volunteers do, the targeting, the polling, uh, cutting up the television ads. And we should respect the proficiency that is involved in doing these things, the practical mastery involved in being a good campaign staffer. But there is a stretch. It's a stretch from there to say that campaign organizations themselves have become professionalized. Actually, most people who work on campaigns in this country are recent college graduates or people on leave, on a sabbatical from college. They are inexperienced. It's often their first full-time job. Those of you in the room who have volunteered may have volunteered many times, five times, 10 times, 20 times in campaigns. And you will meet these people who are 21, 22, working their full, first full-time job. And they want to do well. And they are uh, talented no doubt, but they're not professionals in any meaningful sense of that word. They are not people who have the kind of expertise we associate with professions like the law, the profession, the legal profession, like the, the medical profession, uh, or even um, less professionalized uh, occupational groups like journalists or nurses or social workers. Um, top operatives, experienced operatives, consultants, yes, are professionals in this way too, but many campaign staffers are inexperienced and young, they mean well, they are hardworking, often talented, but not professionals in this way. This is not a criticism of the people involved, it's simply an observation that your local supermarket may in many ways be more professionalized than your local congressional campaign. And this is not a bad thing necessarily because it affords an opportunity for people to get involved. Professions are exclusionary. You can't practice law unless you're a lawyer. You can't practice medicine unless you're a lawyer. 
but you can't become actively involved in politics because it isn't professionalized. It depends on help from people like you. The second um, notion, the notion of mediatization, I also think we need to rethink when we think about the resurgence of ground wars um, and their role in how campaigns communicate. So again, it is true that campaigns rely to a very large extent on television advertising. That's what they spend most of their money on. It is an important part of their communication efforts. It is also true that they are very concerned with spinning the news coverage and feeding uh, reporters' stories, though of course there are fewer and fewer reporters to feed these stories to. Um, Many political scientists and, and communication scholars have argued for years that the emphasis on negative advertising and the tendency of news reporters to cover politics on the basis of what's called sort of a horse race frame or a game frame that emphasize sort of the jogging for position rather than the substance of the political uh, process uh, leads to reduced turnout and repressed political engagement because people can't relate to negative advertisements, they don't like it, and they have a hard time relating to sort of the game frame of politics as a contest rather than a substantial struggle over the direction of the country or of a particular state or, or, or city council, if you will. So that may be true, that mediatized politics has those consequences of reduced turnout and repressed political engagement. But what we need to keep in mind, of course, is that if we adopt a more comprehensive view of the way in which campaigns communicate, looking not only at their media efforts, but also at the ground wars, they are at the very same time as they are bankrolling negative advertisements and feeding the horse race coverage, engaged in a field operation or a ground war effort that has the exact opposite effect, that increased turnout. That is the very purpose of field operations. And that gets people involved, because in contrast to television-based communications or digital communication, personalized political communication is premised on people taking part. Campaigns cannot do it on their own. They need help. They need people to be involved in this process. So that is the third and final um, notion or thought, uh, reflection, I w if you will, on the implications of the resurgence of ground wars that I want to leave you with, is what it means for political participation. This notion that policies is by invitation only it may have been the case, and it is arguably the case in many places where campaigns aren't uh, competitive, or races aren't competitive, where campaigns don't need help. But in competitive districts, campaigns that they need help, they want your help, they want you to get involved. There is a new emphasis on getting people actively involved in the electoral process beyond casting their vote, beyond ca donating a few do dollars, and we need to keep this in mind. Now, we should be clear-eyed about this what this means. I mean, political participation is not simply about whether opportunities exist and about the number of people who participate. It's also about the, the quality, if you will, of this participation. And we shouldn't romanticize ground wars. We shouldn't romanticize field efforts or volunteer mobilizations. This is not sort of civics textbooks democracy. This is not New England township democracy, whatever that ever was. Um, ground wars are instrumental efforts. They're about winning. They're partisan. They're fueled by partisan energies, by the enthusiasm of volunteers who violently disagree with the other party, um, and by the money that flows in from donors and outside interest groups who have a very partisan conception of American politics. And they are stressful, tedious even, at the ground. It is not particularly um, satisfying necessarily to go knock on doors or make these calls. I um, can say that also from a personal point of view as, as part of my research, I spent 10 months in two congressional races and I have knocked on a lot of doors and I have made a lot of calls and talked to a lot of voters. And I think the people in the audience who have either volunteered or worked in campaigns will agree that even though we know it matters, it isn't always equally satisfying to have that conversation at the door or more likely have that door shut in your face um, or to have the conversation over the phone or more likely have someone hang up on you. But what we do know tedious and stressful as it may be, instrumental and partisan as it may be, is it matters. It makes a difference. It makes a difference for the outcome of races, whether you make that effort, make, whether you make that extra call, whether you knock on that extra door, because it helps turn people out. And it provides an opportunity to become an active part of the political process, because today, at least in competitive races, it is the case again that elected officials, candidates for elected office, and the people who advise them see people as a resource as an asset, not as a liability, but as something that can help candidates win. So this is where I'll leave you. Ground wars are an increasingly important part of the way in which campaigns communicate in this country, which is partly about the political juncture we find ourselves at and the ways in which communications has changed in recent years. 
Um, but it's also about democracy. It is about the ways in which we are communicated uh, to as voters. And it's about the opportunity that present themselves if we want to take an active part, if we want to be part of our democracy and do more than vote, more than donate a few dollars, if we want to donate our time because we care about the outcomes of elections, about who represents us uh, in our democracy. Thank you. for Q&A this evening since we have some folks in the overflow room. Um, so I'll just pass that around at the direction of Dr. Nielsen. Barbara, you'd like to start? I'm so curious about your comment that in Europe you don't have the ground wars, the telephone calls, the door to door. And I would like to know what's the turnout since you talked about what the turnout rate is here in this country. Uh, and how many competitive races there are. So mm -hmm. just some broad comparison, mm -hmm. competitive races, you know, why there isn't that door-to-door -door telephone and what's the turnout? Um, thank you for letting me bring Europe into the conversation. Um, those of you who, um, who follow American politics closely and have done so for years will be shocked to hear the turnout in Europe is often 80 or 90 percent. Um, in my own country, Denmark, we had a general election in the fall with 89% turnout, um, and this is in the absence of large-scale field operations. Uh, but a further reason why this isn't done on this scale in Europe isn't simply about uh, the high turnout, but also about um, the absence of voter files. So you can't target this at the individual level. Uh, you have to contact whole blocks uh, about which you know relatively little, and I think the people here in the room who work in campaigns would agree that 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 really makes it much harder to do this in an efficient fashion. And also about the, the difference that most European countries have uh, multi-party systems in which the choice isn't between uh, the two major parties uh, or sort of a, shall we say, um, expressive vote rather than an effective one where you vote for a Green Party candidate or, or a Libertarian candidate in this country. No, I mean in most European countries you'll have two major parties that get about 25% of the vote and the rest of the vote will be spread across a number of minor parties. So you can imagine the conversation at the door is, much, is a very different thing and the pitch is complicated and the emphasis on turnout is, is not as effective in Europe as, as it is here. Hi. In general, is there a screening process for volunteers with, um, with campaigns? Just curious about quality versus quantity. Um, campaigns that are in the fortunate position of having an uh, abundant overflow of volunteers will probably also dedicate some resources to assigning people to the task for which they are most well suited. Um, but if I can answer with an anecdote, if you will, which comes from the Connecticut district in which I did part of my research. Um, the field organizer, one of the regional field organizers who was tasked with, uh, with uh, uh, getting volunteers involved in the, in the get out the vote effort, went in the span of three months over the summer from having as his aspiration recruiting local uh, high school uh, kids to go door to door in their own community wearing their own high school uh, jersey um, to wanting people who aren't crazy and don't look crazy. Um, because at the end of the day, um, Many people aren't particularly enthused um, by electoral politics. Um, and campaigns need a lot of man hours to uh, do this in this large scale that it's done. And importantly, they don't have the organizational overhead that it would require to carefully screen volunteers to train them. That too uh, is hard to find the time to do uh, systematically. In part because many people come in and then they may not come back. So even if you, if you took the time to sit down for half an hour, an hour, to train an individual volunteer, if that person never comes back, that's, a, that's, a, that's not a very effective use of your time. So it's hard for a campaign to find the time and resources to really screen volunteers. It's also hard for them to find enough volunteers that, that it really makes sense to start making qualitative distinctions. So. What impact will the super PACs have on the ground wars in the com forthcoming election? Um, Sorry, um, so the question was what impact will the super PACs have on the ground war in the upcoming election and the, and the, the sort of the unleashing of massive amounts of outside spending uh, made possible by the Citizen United decision by the uh, Supreme Court. In my view, 2004 is instructive uh, for the uh, ability of outside groups that does not have a membership 
to mobilize people to do uh, to pursue ground war uh, efforts. Um, ACT uh, was put together by some of the most experienced and uh, most respected field organizers in the sort of broader democratic liberal coalition. It was incredibly well funded. It was planned many months, even years in advance. Um, and yet, uh, though Steve Rosenthal won't like me for saying this, uh, I think in retrospect, the fact that it hasn't been repeated as an experiment suggests that it was seen as a f less successful than uh, one could have hoped for. Um, and this, in my view, suggests that it is very hard to mobilize, in particular volunteers, to work for an unknown entity, an entity you have no relation to. It is much uh, more effective to try to mobilize people through organizations that they know, that they trust, that they're already part of, the NRA, if you're a uh, conservative, or your congregation, uh, a union, uh, even your local party, uh, democratic or activist groups. Uh, this doesn't mean that the super PACs won't change the dynamics of this, because one thing they can do is invest in infrastructure, in the, in the organizational infrastructure, but also the technical infrastructure for targeting, for instance. So one thing um, that both parties right now are trying to do is to build ways of integrating more and more data into the targeting effort. This is expensive. And, the, and those of you who sort of follow campaign fundraising will know that the fundraising cycle is very seasonal. So campaigns have a sort of a cash flow problem in terms of investing in things well in advance. This is not a problem for super PACs. So they can invest in some of the infrastructure that will help make this effort more, uh, more effective, if you want. So, so. Can I just follow up for a second? Uh, Efforts <laughs> with so I right so if they if they follow the law if they follow yeah. the law how could they be doing that kind of infrastructure work to, that would benefit the campaigns? Um, I'm not a lawyer, um, so I should say I speak here as a layman when it comes to coordination. Um, but I don't think I'm exaggerating if I say that the, it's a widely held view in political circles and also by many lawyers critical of the way in which the coordination uh, clause has been actually, uh, shall we say, enforced or not enforced, um, that um, this span on, on coordination is an inconvenience uh, rather than a, than a sort of effective firewall between different groups. So um, take two examples, if you will. The, the, the major super PAC that's supporting Mitt Romney's candidacy is run by his former campaign manager, and it, it operates out of the same building as the Mitt Romney uh, campaign. And in fact, the, the leader, the director of that super PAC is married to a senior staffer in the Romney campaign, though, of course, they stress that they never talk uh, <laughs> personally, privately, about professional issues. So I'm not saying they're coordinating in the legal sense, because then I would be saying that they are breaking the law. So I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that... Uh, you know, there, are co there is coordination, then there is coordination. Another example of ways in which you can try to get around this is, um, is Catalyst, to so take an example from the Democratic side, if you will. Um, Catalyst is a nominally an, a for-profit company that provides voter file services to liberal, progressive-leaning interest groups. Uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't made a profit, um, and it is, uh, the, the investments came from well-known liberal donors like George Soros and Peter Lewis. Um, it is not clear um, how one would um, determine whether that is a form of coordination or not, that you set up a loss-making for-profit entity that sells services to a certain set of organizations that help them become more, become more effective at pursuing their political goals. Again, I'm not saying the catalyst is coordinating. I'm just suggesting that there are ways in which, as there are with most laws, that you can sort of um, deal with the inconveniences um, of legal regulation. And that is certainly the case with campaign finance, too. Yeah, I was uh, struck by the, the drama of your opening chart that showed the enormous increase in number of contacts uh, per election cycle. And it struck me that it parallels uh, another set of observations that have been made about the uh, declining participation in civic organizations in America that Robert Putnam has mm -hmm. described. Uh, I wonder if the parties are making more intentional voter contacts that had once happened by uh, accident uh, within the walls of a Rotary Club, a Kiwanis Club, a League of Women Voters meeting, all of which have been declining disastrously, mm -hmm. and with a decline in uh, participation of the workforce and labor unions. Mm -hmm. So that in fact, there may have been uh, a much larger number of uncounted person-to-person -person mm -hmm. mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. contacts in the 50s mm -hmm. because they were happening mm -hmm. uh, by virtue of participation in a non-political event. 
Uh, absolutely. I think that's a very, very important point. Um, the, um, the slide I showed is about the number of people who report that someone from the, one of the two major political parties have been around to talk to them. So obviously that charts only partisan contacts by people who represent themselves as coming from a party. Uh, and it is true, one could de do a different chart that would be either a chart where you use the survey data on how many people report that they have conversations about politics at all, which is actually only a portion of the population and a declining portion at that, which would probably be a better way of capturing the, uh, those conversations that took place in a community setting that were nonpartisan or only had a slight partisan leaning and a less, par and a less p party political leaning than the instrumental ones we see the party is pursuing. So I think that's a, that's a very valid point. Thank you. Um, I Sorry, th I think there was a mic coming, so just so we capture it. So. Uh, I'm wondering if you would comment uh, on your observations of um, the, the work of, of volunteers. Uh, it's my observation that in the recent campaigns, 2008, and even what Rove was doing before, it wasn't just a matter of calling people and urging them to vote, mm -hmm. that there was uh, a much more organized effort to find out who they were going to vote mm -hmm. for and to keep track of that, mm -hmm. and that goes in the computer. Mm -hmm. The next round of calls mm -hmm. was just to the people mm -hmm. who had indicated who mm -hmm. they were going to vote for to make sure that they get out to vote. It was more resource intensive and, um, and maybe even more difficult for a volunteer because you weren't quite comfortable sort of confronting people to say who you're going to vote for. But uh, it was then more effective in the campaign mm -hmm. if you could get out mm -hmm. the people who you knew were voting for you. Um, did you observe that more sophisticated mm -hmm. level of, uh, of contact and, and organization? And from the campaigns that you looked at, do you think that that was influential in um, the, uh, the outcomes of the elections? Um, absolutely. It's a, again, it's an, uh, a good point and an important detail of the story that the way campaigns communicate today in a personalized fashion is not simply about pushing a message. It's also about gathering information about the electorate. So you ask people um, who you would like to vote for in the fall, um, what are the issues that are most important to you, and the volunteers will fill out a form or, or punch it into their smartphone and carry that information back to the campaign, which is then fed in to the voter files and used in the targeting effort as over time you refine your targeting to, to, to hone in on the people who are uh, the most valuable targets. Because of course, at the end of the day, what campaigns are most interested in is this question of, well, who are you going to vote for, right? So that information is, is the thing they really want to model. Um, you will read occasionally in the press uh, stories about micro-targeting and the sort of the vast amounts of data that goes into this kind of targeting uh, effort. And th there has been made major strides in, in, in how this is done and how effective it is in terms of pinpointing the people that is most uh, valuable to talk to. It's even called nano-targeting now by the Republican Party, and micro apparently wasn't uh, sexy enough. Um, I think it is important, though, to hesitate um, before sort of fully buying the uh, stories told by the consultants who are purveyors of these services that they're selling to campaigns, um, there are limits to the sophistications of this. Uh, and there are limits, uh, there's an sort of uneven nature of the data in some districts. In some cases, you have a lot of data on people. In others, you have less because there have been fewer compared to the races because you have a more unevenly maintained voter file. And at the end of the day, one of the most important things that a campaign would want to vote about, know about a voter is where do they live? What's their phone number? And just maintaining that part of the data is actually hard. It requires a lot of work, which is part of the reason why volunteers are asked to bring back this information, because the fact that someone has moved is no longer this number. That in itself is actually important. So a, a, a rough figure I've heard mentioned is the idea that since the 2008 election, about 20% of the electorate has moved. And if you look at, at particular social demographic groups, so for instance, take some of the core parts of the uh, electoral base of the Democratic Party, um, African Americans, uh, Latinos, uh, lower income groups, students, uh, younger folks, they're actually more about, the Census uh, Bureau estimates that about 20% move every year. So just in terms of keeping the voter file up to date, this is part of the reason also why the same voter files that are used for the presidential elections are made available to local and state level and federal elections in the midterms, in part to help them, but also because the clause is then you pay a nominal fee to get access to this information. But in return, you sign over the response data that you have collected, which helps keep the voter file up to date and precise 
for the next big presidential uh, contest. I actually Sorry. would like to ask sure. a follow-up question to that, which <laughs> is um, talking about the, the data and the voter file. Are you familiar with any campaigns, um, and thinking back to the Obama app, that are designing applications um, for the iPhone and other smartphones that when you agree to them, um, or sorry, or designing apps for Facebook, that when you agree to them, you're also agreeing for them to pull information from your profile, pull your friends. Mm -hmm. Has there been anything sort of in coordination? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, this is one of the dreams of, uh, of many political operatives is to um, find a way that is convenient and persuasive to get volunteers to sign over their uh, social network uh, profiles. Um, you get it at a low level. The low level ask is to ask people to donate their Facebook status uh, for messages, in particular get out the vote messages, maybe to retweet things for the campaign in a systematic fashion. But the real dream, of course, is that people sign over control of their Facebook network so that the campaign can match the voter file and the, the voters who have been identified as, as persuadables or as lazy partisans who should be mobilized with the networks of every volunteer so that instead of being asked to contact strangers, you're asked to contact people that you actually know. Now, one thing is sort of the dreams and aspirations of um, tech-savvy um, political operatives. Another thing is the, I think, um, I think it's safe to say empirical fact that it turns out that most of us are more comfortable talking to strangers about politics than we are about imposing our political views on our network of friends and family. We may do it with close friends who know where we stand and have that conversation, but with sort of an acquaintance, less so. So this is much harder in practice to persuade people to actually do this than, than I think some of the tech-savvy uh, operatives who pioneer these ideas thought at the outset. So the push is there, but um, I'm not sure there are so many people who are buying. Yeah, talk about fewer. Uh, yes, you talk about fewer and fewer competitive races. It's probably 80 to maybe 100 in the entire country now. Now, my question has to do that if there are fewer and fewer competitive races, more and more primaries become more important. Mm -hmm. Is this ground war still going to be utilized a great deal in the primary mm -hmm. races then? Uh, great question again. Um, Actually, you could make the argument that field operations are even more important in primaries than they are in general elections because turnout is an even more decisive factor. Very few people take part. Um, I gave a, a presentation about my work uh, Tuesday night uh, at, uh, in New York where the, the respondent to my talk was a, a man who was running for city council. The, the primary is, is 13 months away. And the win number he's been given by his consultant for a district that has 210,000 inhabitants is 6,000 votes. So the next 13 months, he is going to be catering to these 6,000 voters, uh, in part himself personally, but also by having uh, house parties through volunteers and having his volunteers go to talk to their neighbors and on and on. So the primaries are absolutely an area in which you want to do this if you want to do it uh, intensely. And I would say, actually, if you wanted to see the most sophisticated, well-funded, and intensely fought ground wars, you would have to go to Iowa and New Hampshire for the presidential election. I mean, that is where the action really is. And of course, uh, that's also where the voters, in the end, are perhaps most fed up with knocks on the doors from total strangers uh, who, uh, who just have one more candidate that they want to talk to them about, because everyone is talking to the same people. Um, I would say also that this is also, and uh, the primaries are also an area in which we get a sense of the even wider implications of this, because precisely because ground wars involve ideally volunteers who happen to have often quite partisan views. They also have a tendency over time to influence the dynamics of the primaries themselves. So you've seen this with the Tea Party movement in the Republican Party that, and of course historically also, the same grassroots energies that can help propel a Barack Obama to the White House can also saddle you with George McGovern. And the same uh, volunteer support that can help Ronald Reagan to the White House can give you Barry Goldwater. So. This helps explain that though it is well established that this is effective to get volunteers involved, there is still, if you will, a lingering unease among some of the operatives who, even if they are quite partisan themselves, also are conscious that many volunteers have more uh, strident political views than much of the electorate and uh, would want the p candidates to adopt those views, and if the candidates won't, maybe to replace the candidates with more partisan uh, candidates. And of course, this is a tactical challenge from, from the point of view of the, of the parties. I'm wondering about the, the, the ground wars in House races during a presidential year like mm -hmm. you followed. Then I would imagine in both those districts, 
volunteers would encounter voters in Connecticut who would be planning to vote for Obama but like Chris Shays as a liberal Republican. And maybe to some extent in New Jersey, people would be, have been planning to vote for McCain but want more women in Congress and vote mm -hmm. for. Were there tensions you saw in the campaigns of the volunteers having to, to deal with their divided loyalties, perhaps, in that? Or? Absolutely, and, I, and, and also, importantly, tensions within the campaign itself, that the, the volunteers who uh, perhaps initially came out because they wanted to help Obama and then were encouraged by the Obama campaign to actually instead help a competitive House uh, race uh, instead, in some cases were confronted with candidates who weren't necessarily uh, as liberal or progressive as that volunteer in question imagined that Obama was. And there would be some argument sometimes over uh, whether actually this volunteer in question would then help or whether they would rather go off to Pennsylvania or another uh, area where they could, could, could help, uh, in their view, help uh, Obama win by an even larger uh, margin uh, than, than he already would. Um, at the door, absolutely, too. Uh, th there are, there are, there are tension-filled conversations. And this plays out very differently depending on whether you have a, you know, a knowledgeable, motivated volunteer who can engage in that conversation and have it, or whether you have, say, a paid canvasser. And again, this is not a criticism of the people involved, but it remains a fact that many of the people who do knock on doors for $10 an hour are not necessarily particularly interested in politics or particularly knowledgeable about politics. So of course, from the point of view of a voter, that's a very different conversation if you have someone who doesn't actually know very much about the positions of the candidate. So for instance, take one example. Um, as you'll remember, the, the TARP, uh, the Troubled Assets Relief Package, the Bush version of the, of, the, of the stimulus package, was being debated hotly in Congress in the run-up to the 2008 election. And of course, voters would ask us, as we were knocking on doors, where does the candidate stand on this? Uh, many of the paid canvassers didn't know this. I mean, didn't know where the candidate stand in the first place. Well, sometimes because the candidate didn't have a position on this yet, but also because they didn't know what this was. So that's a real challenge at the door. So those tensions are very real. So. I think I should, if there are any questions over here, I've been sort of yes. talking to the, no? Okay. Did you have no. a question? Sorry. I'll give you a second chance. Oh, thank you. Oh. Hi, thanks. I, I was just thought maybe you can elaborate on the specific campaigns that you worked on, mm -hmm. how they handled the issue of volunteers who went off message. Um, okay, so say, so say that, uh, to sort of underline again, the, the two campaigns I looked at was the Jim Himes campaign in the 4th Congressional District and the Linda Center campaign in the 7th District here, who had different views on this because the Himes campaign had actually embraced Obama and ran Himes as pretty, though it's a very wealthy district indeed and a pretty moderate district, actually ran Himes as a bit of a progressive to cater to a Democratic base in the cities, whereas Stender, as, as mentioned, was pitched more as a moderate. So. People would go off message in different ways, right? In, in Connecticut, they would go off message by, um, by bad-mouthing Chris Chase, which wasn't part of the strategy at all. It was more about saying that Himes is closer to Obama. If you like Obama, you should also like Himes. Whereas in, 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 this, in the district here in New Jersey, the problem was more often that the volunteers would be more partisan than the campaign would perhaps want them to be. Now, different staffers, and this I think is at the level of sort of practical expertise that we need to, to take seriously, and also that frankly we don't know that much about. I mean, the staffers themselves, of course, know about this, but isn't examined in any systematic fashion either by political scientists or indeed even by the people who evaluate campaigns, uh, is how do you handle this? So, the hard line, if you will, is the one that's presented at the few training sessions that are given. The campaign has a carefully crafted message that is important, that you stick to the message and that you stick to the script. And then at the end of the day, many of the staffers who work at the interface between the formal campaign organization and the volunteers <coughs> are a bit more forgiving because they know from experience that at the end of the day, you, it's very hard to control that message. It's hard in part because the volunteers and paid cameras will go off script occasionally, but it's even harder because the voter won't walk through the boilerplate script that you have given them. The voter have views of their own. They want their things they want to know or things they don't want to hear about, and that part is even harder to control. So from the point of view of staffers who have, a, shall we say, a list, um, uh, who are less strict in their view of this, it is more important to control who you talk to and that you have at least a few talking points to lean on uh, in case you're in doubt than to sort of micromanage uh, the message at the door. Because at the end of the day, that is probably not a realistic uh, thing to, to hope for. So. And I think we'll probably just have to call maybe last question here. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't know if we have okay. a new question for somebody. Let's take the two losses, okay? And I'll that, take two in a row. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, 
In the uh, 2008 Obama uh, election, they mustered resources uh, in New Jersey mm -hmm. to call and talk to people in mm -hmm. Virginia. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's uh, new, you know, sending your resources where it mattered, not where it, because mm -hmm. New Jersey was somewhat of a safe mm -hmm. state for mm -hmm. uh, Obama? And uh, my second question is, you showed a, uh, a, a picture of uh, talking about enthusiasm, uh, Obama, mm -hmm. big stadium, Romney, small crowd. What do you think is going to happen uh, this year with regard to enthusiasm for Obama? Mm -hmm. I mean, will he be able to reach the elevation that I thought he reached, mm -hmm. the high elevation mm -hmm. that he reached in 2008? Because that seems so key to getting people to come out and spend their time on your behalf for free. Let's take the other question in the back. I'll take responsibility. Yes, I have some comments, and I'd just like your, um, your reaction to them. Um, I've worked as a volunteer for quite a few political campaigns, and my observations are that the, vol quote, volunteers that get paid are much less effective than volunteers who don't take money. Um, I remember for the Corzine election, they had an, what I would call an open call at Rutgers mm -hmm. by the stadium, and they were just swamped with so many more people than they could fit on buses. They didn't have enough buses, and they had to turn people away, and it was a near riot. Mm -hmm. But the effectiveness of that day, I don't think was very good. If they had taken the people who were willing to get on those buses for nothing, then I think they would have had people who were dedica really dedicated to the cause and not just trying to pick up an extra buck. Mm -hmm. Also, my comment about um, the field, some of the field paid field organizers, I find that they're very enthusiastic, have a lot of energy and dedication, but they're just not experienced in dealing with people and volunteers um, due to their, their, well, I don't want to say their youth, but their inexperience. And uh, I'd like to know what you have to say with that, because I think some of the campaigns have been lost that I thought were pretty sure because of um, the lack of experience, not the lack of dedication or enthusiasm to the, to the, um, the person running, but just that they didn't know how to run the office. They did not know how to organize the volunteers. They did not know how to do the training. And I think people, while I'm 60, I think you know we kind of get overlooked because we're older. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, so I'll take them in reverse order. Uh, to start with this point about the, uh, the field organizers, I think it's important. Um, let, let me start with, uh, with saying that a lot of people share your view. I mean, that's very clear. A lot of the volunteers in both campaigns would refer to the staffers as the kids. Uh, and a lot of volunteers, frankly, are more experienced than, than at least the junior staffers who are doing the field organizing. They have volunteered in several campaigns. Often they are quite engaged in local politics and in, in member groups of various sorts and have a lot of experience uh, running these things. Um, but, and, and there's no question that uh, many staffers of slightly more experienced staffers appreciate that and I, in an ideal world would want the field organizers to be more experienced. Um, but there is a bit of a supply and demand problem, which is that there is no pool of readily available, experienced field organizers who are, who are willing to work the kind of hours that campaigns demand and for the kind of salaries that campaigns are capable of paying to do the field organizing work. We're talking about $2,000 a month about to work 60, 70 hours a month, uh, sorry, a, a week, a month would be pretty nice, um, a week f for three months. So it's a short-term, precarious, poorly paid job. I mean, they make less than the paid cameras. I'll tell per you, hour. If like sure, but no, but, but think about it from a from an organizational point of view. That to make it work practically, you would have to be willing to do it pretty much full time. Mm -hmm. So if if you were willing to do that, I, I think there are many campaigns who would be very keen to actually work with you in doing that, and and maybe sometimes it would be hard to make it work out in practice. But I think they would be willing to to work with you. But just to to say that, I mean, that it isn't that campaigns. Um, wouldn't like to have you know all of the field organizers being someone who had been a un union organizer before or a community organizer or had run a local uh, faith-based group. It's just that the kinds of people who are willing to take those jobs are mostly college students, and that, as you say, will will sometimes come with sort of a bit of a sort of a, a few child's diseases 
of, of, uh, of actually uh, making things work, not because these people aren't talented or enthusiastic, but because they don't have the experience or the expertise necessarily. So some people do it very well, others uh, try to do it very well, but perhaps things work out as well. In terms of the effectiveness, it, it is proven beyond a doubt that volunteers are more effective uh, than paid people in terms of persuading voters and in terms of turning voters out. But the practical challenge from the point of view of campaigns is that you will have a target number, you have a certain number of doors you want to knock, you have a certain number of calls you want to make, and in almost all cases, you can't hope to mobilize enough volunteers to do that. And you can't count on that happening. And even if you would like volunteers to do that, it is more important that you get it done than that volunteers do it. So I that's when you resort to the paid people. I don't see the, the natural reach out to the older, more mature people. Mm -hmm. you know, you get there and they've already stamped with, mm -hmm. all, their, with all the young people mm -hmm. because that's their natural talent pool. But they don't, they don't first look to see the, the experience. We're not on the outside track if you're not in with the schools or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. then you're kind of on the outside. And I know many people my age would be very willing to do. Because mm -hmm. I've done everything mm -hmm. for free for all these mm -hmm. years. You know, just because I'm dedicated to the causes. There are I don't know that they really reach out. There are people here in the room who work in New Jersey politics who, who I'm sure are taking notes now, so we'll contact you later to, to benefit from, from your work. But I, I, there are real problems of matching supply and demand, and I think there are people like you who feel, who feel like that. And I can just say that the Himes campaign, uh, when one of their field organizers buckled under the pressure and left a month before the election because he couldn't deal with it anymore, a college kid, he was replaced by a 60, I think 63-year-old former school teacher and union activist from upstate New York and she was by far the best field organizer on that campaign, no question about it. And had the campaign had the opportunity of having her from the outset, they would have loved to have her. But they're just, it's, it's hard to make these things work in practice. So I take your point, but I think it's, it's, there is a larger structural problem, if you will, also about the campaign's ability to find these people in the first place. They may not have heard of you, I mean, because they're out-of-state staffers. Uh, and they don't know anyone in the district, so that's another problem. Or they're you know, college students who aren't particularly well connected in the local community. So there is another problem of information, if you will. So a lot of these things, there's room for improvement, but I think it's important <laughs> to emphasize, as, as I emphasize with, you, with the, the frustrations you feel, also to emphasize with the practical challenges that the staffers face in trying to make this work, and that at the end of the day, they have to settle for good enough rather than the best in many cases. So the two other points about um, Enthusiasm for Obama, um, I mean, I'm going to buy everyone in this room a beer if, if he mobilized the same number of uh, volunteers this time around as he did in 2008. I mean, I just don't see that happening. And I'm going to buy everyone in this room a beer if he mobilized the same number of volunteers as he did in 2008. I just, just don't see that happening. And, and, it's, and that doesn't mean that they won't pursue a field operation, again, because they certainly will. Actually, of course, of course they are. But they're not going to get three million people to volunteer this time around. I, I don't see that happening. We had 500 at the office opening in Middlesex, and they're already. <laughs> yeah. Which is but you would, I mean, to get three million volunteers, what's the population of New, Jer New Jersey? Oh, about I six and a half million? I mean, you would have to get, what, 65,000 volunteers in this state alone. I don't see that happening. Um, if it happens, you know, good for him. I don't see that happening. And that, I think, underlines the importance of, the, of part of the, the story I've been telling today, which is that we need to look at this in a historical perspective and not conflate ground wars or field operations with the exceptional volunteer fueled operation of Obama in 2008. There will be paid people working for Obama this year, doing this for $10 an hour, because they will still want to reach their target universes, and they're not going to get enough volunteers to do it. In my, that's, my, that's my intuition, at least, at this stage. In terms of the out-of-state work, um, it would be interesting if someone in the room know, knows the origins of that. Uh, I don't know how uh, long campaigns have been, or parties actually, because it's probably more parties who have been channeling calls to, to competitive states from, from non-competitive states. Uh, I would think that it's probably been happening on a large scale at the earliest from 2004, because the precondition for doing it is that you, is technology, is that you have a voter file that you can share across state lines. And before 2004, in the case of the Democratic Party, this wasn't available. So that would then you would have to go to the Virginia State Party and say, you know, will you share your voter file with New Jersey? <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> fat chance. And then you'll do fundraising in our state? Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. also the calls, all that. So the logistics have really changed because of developments in technology. So I don't know exactly how long this has been going on and on what scale, but I would think it's probably most of the two last cycles we've seen that. 
Uh, and, and now, of course, it's a bigger and bigger thing. You do distributed phone banks, you can make calls from your home, you can make calls from an office that's set up in New York City where the Trotskyists and the Republicans are running neck to neck, and you can call into, into competitive uh, races elsewhere. Uh, but it's a relatively recent phenomenon, I think, uh, and it'd be interesting to hear if people have um, further details on that. One last question, and then, then, we'll, uh, then I think we should wrap up. So I'll take someone who hasn't asked before. To what extent, to the extent that I've been helping, mm -hmm. I find that it's been very difficult to reach people mm -hmm. because they all have cell phones mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. they're not or they're not answering their phones. Mm -hmm. You may leave messages. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering to what extent that has been catalogued and assessed. Yeah, I mean that's that's a major practical challenge for the campaigns. It's uh, fewer and fewer landlines, more and more cell phones. People have caller ID. Um, and, and they're not particularly keen necessarily to, to take a call from a stranger uh, or in particular for an unknown number uh, or an unavailable number. So that's a real practical challenge which only further underlines the importance of door-to-door -door canvassing um, because at the end of the day though people will also ignore a, a canvasser at their door or close the door on them, there are a set of social conventions that kick in. I mean we aren't as rude to people in person as we are over the phone at the end of the day. I mean, think about telemarketing. I'm pretty bad with telemarketers. If they call me, I'm like, thank you, but no thank you, and then I hang up. I wouldn't do that at the door. I mean, th there is a real human being who has come here who wants to have a conversation with you. You may be curt and, and sort of have a, want to have a short conversation, but we can see in terms of the rate of contacts that door-to-door -door reach more people off the number contacted. So cell phones, major challenge. Phones in general, very hard. You have much lower contact rates. You may call 30 people, get three contacts. Knocking on doors, you knock on 10 doors, you get three contacts. So the rate of success is higher with door-to-door. -door. Of course, it's hard in many areas, rural areas in particular. Uh, but yeah, phones, major, major challenge, door-to-door. -door, uh, that works uh, more efficiently. So, OK, thank you very much. <laughs>